Hi, I am Faiz Zanad. I am the founder and the co-chairman of the CVCT meeting, Cardiovascular Clinical Trials, which is in Washington early December each year. This meeting discusses the clinical trial science and the major results of uh, clinical trials in the area of cardiorenal metabolism and cardiovascular in general. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome today uh, Wolfgang Koenig and uh, Bob uh, Rosenson, who are both uh, the um, co-chair and the spearheaded of the atherosclerosis uh, trial session at CBCT. Uh, Bob, uh, can you introduce yourself, please? I serve as director of metabolism and lipids for the Mount Sinai Health System, mm -hmm. where I actually organize clinical trials and clinical care within a multi-hospital network. Been involved in clinical trials, mechanistic-based, translational medicine, and uh, phase uh, two, phase three uh, trials. And this has been a very exciting opportunity to work uh, with you and Wolfgang for many years on CVCT atherosclerosis sessions. Thank you, Wolfgang. Yeah, uh, Faiz, as you know, I'm a cardiologist here at the uh, German Heart Center uh, in Munich for more, around 10 years now. And I have a strong interest in clinical trials in biomarkers, clinical epidemiology of cardiovascular disease. And uh, I'm running here a um, cardiometabolic unit, um, a, a fairly large uh, unit where we do clinical trials, uh, also genetic testing for, for FH, for example, in a, specific, in a special lipid outpatient clinic. And I have a long-standing interest, as mentioned already, in clinical trials, and really had the pleasure, mostly together with Bob, to be part of the CVCT, which really uh, provides a very unique perspective on clinical trials. And I think our main aim uh, for these three, for this series of three uh, uh, papers, was to look at clinical trials from this specific point of view of a clinical trialist, and this gives you maybe a different. Um, a different uh, entrance into the whole field as uh, just going to uh, to cardiology or to um, uh, metabolic uh, meetings. I'm so pleased to have you today in this uh, informal discussion about clinical trial in the lipid area. And the lipid area is so diverse. Uh, there are many lipid fraction, many therapies. Uh, and uh, the reason we are having this discussion is that we have had year and year over the last few years meetings at CVCT, the Cardiovascular Clinical Trialist Forum, whereby you have been leading some of the very high level discussion with uh, the uh, colleague trialists, but also uh, investigators from different backgrounds and certainly with patient and with regulators, with the FDA and EMA as well, and with industry and many other stakeholders in order to advance the field of uh, uh, improving clinical trial design and getting faster to innovation, but also improving implementation of the finding of uh, the latest trials, uh, because there are lots of unmet needs and, and gaps in evidence. So maybe we can get started with a few uh, very general questions about the unmet needs. And, and I understand in every discussion about clinical trials, we try to start with this because indeed, the further we go, the further we discover that we are the the the, the glass is half empty, right? So how uh, is the uh, glass is half empty? Because we have done a wonderful progresses in treating dyslipidemia over the last few years, but there are still a long way to go. So any one of you would like to summarize the situation so far and uh, the gaps in evidence? So there's uh, a lot of unmet needs in the lipid field. We have to recognize that we have new targets based on genomic medicine that allow us to go after certain specific pathways that are causally related to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. On the background of high intensity statin, azetamibe, and perhaps a PCSK9 inhibitor, there are many patients that can't tolerate the medications or don't achieve adequate LDL cholesterol lowering. We have new targets such as angiopoietin like 3 inhibitors and others that effectively lower LDL cholesterol, but only are proven for orphan indication in patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. The question is, can we expand those new therapies, those proven therapies for individuals that may be more common 
such as heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. What are the issues involved? Issues that may be related to working with regulators to move beyond an orphan indication when you're dealing with an autosomal dominant disorder and perhaps thinking about subclinical atherosclerosis imaging studies as a surrogate marker of disease followed by long-term safety with the registry? Well, that's the general issue of prevention trials, right? Um, of course, you uh, have uh, as a starting point, cholesterol as being an accepted surrogate. Uh, how much it is still accepted as a surrogate? I know when I've started in clinical trials, I've learned only that there is blood pressure and cholesterol, which may be accepted as surrogate. At that time, uh, the regulators accepted glycated hemoglobin and glucose as a surrogate, but it's no longer accepted as a surrogate. So how much cholesterol is in itself accepted as a basis for approval? I mean, what, what we have seen uh, over the last, I must, I must say, uh, 25 years, is in numerous uh, large-scale clinical trials which have consistently shown that uh, lowering LDL uh, cholesterol uh, is beneficial and uh, the lower the better, I think is a very well accepted uh, paradigm today. Uh, still, when you look into the history of clinical trials, I think for all um, the drugs that have been approved so far, an endpoint trial uh, was done, although the vast majority of clinical trials came from the statin field. So you may, uh, you may have uh, thought that uh, since uh, these are drugs from the same class, why would you need uh, another endpoint? Well, now, I mean, there are some experiences, some negative experiences we have made. Uh, think about uh, cerevastatin, uh, for example. It was a statin, and the clinical trial has shown that it has severe negative side effects also. It comes from the, uh, uh, the class of statin itself. With other drugs, we have made a uh, good experience. So I think uh, if you have, in, in particular, what you're dealing uh, with right now is a number of really novel uh, um, novel drugs from um, based on RNA technology, uh, etc. And if it's a first in class drug, I think there is no way out. You have to do a large scale uh, outcome trials because you're also looking, even in, in smaller trials, you have no signal of a severe side effects. You may have uh, smaller side effects that you only can detect uh, when you do a large scale uh, trial with, uh, with end, uh, hard endpoints and follow people sufficiently long. So I think uh, it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's difficult for new classes or for new drugs uh, to approve them without any uh, endpoint trial. I think there's a specific situation, and, I've, and I believe uh, Bob has already alluded to, uh, to those. Look, for example, into very rare uh, locations like homozygous uh, FH, uh, you, it's very difficult to get these patients and to, to do large outcome trials uh, is in, in some instances probably impossible. So in these instances, um, we certainly might consider to use surrogate markers. And uh, we have a number of uh, imaging uh, um, technologies available that consistently uh, have shown uh, positive results with lipid lowering. So in these um, instances with uh, um, uh, rare diseases, difficult to get patients. Uh, I think this might be a, a valuable alternative to get uh, ready in time for a new uh, treatment. But now there are, you know, some contradiction in what we hear here. And on the one hand, you say we need large clinical trials because we need to uh, secure safety, right? This is the main reason. Uh, but then there are often diseases. There aren't so many patients out there in order to get a large outcome trials. And on the other hand, you have cholesterol as a good surrogate, but you say that is not sufficient because it's not surrogate for safety. And especially these new RNA therapeutics and others, these are novel therapeutic drugs which may have uh, you know, unexpected safety. So how to balance that? The issue of safety, large trial, there are, you know, multiple ways in clinical trial science in general. It's either to enrich the patient population or to go to uh, mechanistic surrogates uh, or uh, that, uh, to have something else, which is uh, post-approval uh, trials, which may have yeah. an extension of safety. So what anyone would like really to comment to the three options. The first option, which is how much you can enrich the patient populations 
in order to get uh, a higher likelihood of responders and therefore a smaller trial. Maybe, um, Rob, can you discuss this first? Yes, yeah, so I just want to make the point of a top-down approach. Some of these therapies are approved for patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, but there are patients with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia that are on statins, PCSK9, and or azetamide, who still have LDL cholesterol levels that are too high. And if they're on the background of three therapies and their LDL cholesterol is still high, that's also an extremely high-risk population. Do we need to, need to do an outcome study on those individuals? I completely agree that if you have somebody that's at lower risk without these proven monogenic disorders, that we need to do randomized clinical trials. We need to evaluate the efficacy and the safety of the therapy. I'm on board you know, for that, but you know, going from the top to the next uh, tier, can there be a pathway forward for those individuals who often have myocardial infarctions at the age of 20 to 25 for men and 35 to 40 in women? So how to get there? Uh, if you get to the larger group of patients with low risk than you know, genetic disorders, um, it's either go through 10,000 patients over 10 years follow-up, or you enrich the patient population for likelihood of response or for likelihood of running into uh, uh, events. So, so Volkan, uh, what are the techniques that you use in uh, the lipid world of enriching the patient population in including and excluding criteria? I mean, there are a number of approaches with uh, with different markers depending upon what you are studying. So, for example, if you look into anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, uh, you certainly would uh, go for a, a high inflammatory burden to really catch the the, the appropriate uh, the appropriate uh, patient. Uh, if you go to other areas, maybe genetics, as Bob has already alluded to, may may help us. Uh, and uh, I'm myself would see a, a great future for polygenic risk scores, for example, to introduce and uh, um, measure those and, and uh, get uh, an enriched uh, collective of uh, patients that we then uh, enter in with, them, uh, with those you will then do a clinical trial. Uh, and there are a number of uh, yeah, approaches uh, underway. We certainly haven't reached the end of that story, but it looks to me very promising and one uh, important way to really increase, uh, in, uh, enrich uh, the study population by this by this means. Um, I mean, we have seen in, in uh, for example, with the with the uh, LP, uh, little a that um, you, uh, that um, well, this is not genetic basis, but it's it's uh, um, based on the biomarker. Uh, you uh, the, the higher the LP little a uh, is, uh, the higher is the risk of uh, these patients, and the more pronounced is the uh, efficacy or the relative risk reduction. For example, as you have seen in in uh, in, in uh, Fourier and Odyssey, for example. Um, so high levels of various biomarkers, uh, risk scores are for me two ways uh, that are worth following up in the future.